now, here is Tiki Fullerton on Your Money. Hello there, I'm Tiki Fullerton, every night bringing you a full hour of the very best in business coverage across the nation and internationally, especially where business and politics meet. Coming up, Las Vegas comes to town. Wynn makes a bid for James Packer's Crown Casino. We'll cross live to Melbourne with the Herald Sun's Terry McCran and our own Leo Shanahan next. The government greenlights Adani's groundwater plan ahead of calling an election. How will the campaign battle, battle play out? Top analysis from former campaign director and political advisor Graham Morris. And the union push for representation on all company boards. AWU Secretary Dan Walton joins me direct from the annual conference on the Gold Coast. Well, let's go to the breaking news today. Uh, and the federal government has given the Adani coal mine the go-ahead. Environment Minister Melissa Price signed off the groundwater management plans, while the CSIRO and Geoscience Australia confirmed scientific requirements had been met. So now it's over to the Queensland Labor government. How will this latest move play into the election campaign and what more broadly should business be doing through the campaign? Well, joining me live from Canberra now is Graham Mor Morris, uh, Barton Deacon, Government Relations Chairman. Graham, nice to see you there. Um, now, look, the campaign has clearly begun. We've got this Adani decision. Did that surprise you that Melissa Price put it through before the uh, Prime Minister announced when the election would be? It doesn't surprise me at all, Tiki. I think it's a good idea. You know, the, the government was sort of sitting on a barbed wire fence and they sort of had the people who were pro-jobs in North Queensland and pro the mine versus those who weren't and both sides were upset because there was no decision. So at least this way, those who want jobs in Queensland, those who want the royalties from the coal, they'll be happy and the other mob probably aren't going to vote for the coalition anyway. So it just clears the air a little bit and now the pressure goes on Mr Shorten, Tanya Plebisek, Albanese and those sort of people are they what we're, and, and you've got Chris Bowen the shadow treasurer at the press club tomorrow mm. and sort of you know are they in favor of this or not yes well indeed but where does that put for example the safety of uh, say Greg Hunt in his seat or indeed the treasurer Josh Frydenberg I gather uh, get up is uh, promising to do a lot more calls now yeah, but they were going to do that anyway. Mm. And, and I still think, look, if you are a sitting member in a reasonably safe seat in Melbourne and you are vulnerable to some decision way up, you know, north of northern, northern Australia, um, it sort of doesn't make sense. It means you, you haven't been doing the electorate stuff properly mm. um, or else you let this issue get out of control in your own electorate, which is just, when you think about it, it's just plain silly. What are the other big issues? I mean, we're seeing a lot of noise today uh, around uh, Huang Zhang Mo, obviously, and Peter Dutton. That, that's been a, a little storm in a teacup. I see former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull stirring the possum there. Equally, there's a, another burning sort of debate about electric cars. What do you think are going to be the key things that drive this campaign? Look, you'll have all sorts of things come in and out each, each day as the journos get excited about, about <laughs> something or other. Mm. But look, the, the, the big ones are still, you know, who is best for me and my family when they walk into the polling booth? Mm. Who is, who, who is the, the, the name that I'm ticking or putting a one against on the ballot paper? Is my local member good? Is, my, is the, the opposing candidate better? You know, those sort of things still really count. And that, to me, is the job of the Prime Minister, his campaign team, and the electorate, the people on the ground. They have to shift between now and polling day, let's say about 39 days. They've got to shift about 3,000 votes in each of the 15 to 20 marginals. There's no doubt the government's starting behind. Mm. You know, it's, it's, it's not as bad as it was a few, few months ago, but they're mm. starting behind. So the job is to shift votes in those marginal seats, and that's the campaign. Mm. So when you have an announcement, as you did from Labor, about, say, cancer, uh, or there's a big announcement around border security, are these the sorts of things that will shift voters' minds more so than what's going on at the local electorate level? 
I, I think they will go in and out, those sorts of things. Mm. The one I think that the, the government ought to do, and certainly the campaign team, not necessarily the Prime Minister, but the ads and everything from the campaign team, and it's also what Labor's got to defend, and that is this unease about Mr Shorten. You know, people are saying, look, we quite like Scott Morrison. The coalition has been a bit all over the place, but he seems to know what he's doing. He seems a decent sort of a bloke. When you start talking about Mr Shorten, it is sort of, oh, I'm not sure, something uneasy about it. I'm not quite sure he's a prime minister. Yeah. And that, to me, is where you would run if you were running the advertising for the coalition. Yeah, so, I mean, I mean, let's be honest about this. It, it, people are in it to win, whatever it takes, as somebody once said. Um, but uh, so you think uh, well, actually well, it's, getting it's, quite it's all, personal it's also, is, is, is actually the success formula for the government if it's, go, if it's yeah. going to retain power? Yeah. Mm, okay. Yeah, as the coalition, as, as, the, as the Labor Party, we, we would all love to run a positive campaign anywhere around the world. We'd love to do it. We yep. just have never seen one that works. Uh, speaking of a sector that hasn't been terribly good at running a positive campaign at the moment, the business sector, and a particularly big business, Graham. I mean, how do you think their strategy has gone over the last 12, 18 months? I'd be really interested to know. And what should they be doing now? I, I've been really disappointed. You know, just think this time in the last election campaign, um, the coalition promised big, big tax cuts for big business. Mm. And bis bis big business just sat there, folded their arms until it was almost all over. You know, the Labor Party had said bad tax cuts shouldn't be going to big business. And right in the, in the 11th hour, some people, you know, started campaigning from the Business Council, talking to the independents in the Senate. It was too late. And now when you think about it, you know, we're, we're about to have another campaign four years later. There's some three years later. There's good stuff for small business, but there's not going to be much for big business anymore. And I just think the Business Council, the Chamber of Commerce, um, Australian Industry Group, I, I just I just don't think they did their job. Well, Fancy. Well, they, they are the lobby Fancy groups. Not but I mean, yeah. What, what about the big Australian and, uh, you know, some of the, the big campaigns, I mean, you know, where people like um, Alan Joyce did come out quite strongly and directly. It's hard for the big banks, it has to be said, because, uh, I mean, well, the, the runs on the board weren't good, were they? No, that's true, but, but they all came in too late. You know, half of them were running around about social issues like gay, went, gay marriage, mm. you know, when they should have been focusing solely on the thing that should have united the business community and that was the tax cuts and they came in way 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 too late it was all over mm. and you know they'll sit there and wonder and now it looks as if 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 mr shorten won now it looks as if you will have trade unions saying to mr shorten hey i got a good idea let's put a trade unionist on the board of the top 100 companies well, that's exactly what Dan what? Horton is saying today. We'll be speaking to him in a minute. Exactly what he's saying today. Well, well, if you, if, if, if you were going live, you'd be saying to him, well, I've got a good idea. Yeah. Let's put a business person on the board of each, each of the <laughs> trade unions. That'll liven him up. Indeed. So um, what about the credit squeeze uh, that, uh, that, that is around at the moment? What about the importance of big business to the overall security of the economy and the overreach, the combination of Hain uh, and uh, these powerful regulators now and a potential Labour government and this sort of pressure from activism? Uh, can, is, should business be chirping up more about overshoot? Look, clearly tricky big business you know, is damn important in this country. And in most cases, they're fantastic. They're fantastic at doing what they do, and that's the mm. job of business. It's when they get into politics and whatnot, they seem to make a mess of things. Um, yeah, look, I, I, I think there is some unease out there at the moment in the community, and it's, it's, it's across, across the board. But one of the things, I think, is that the credit squeeze, but also the fear of negative gearing and capital gains tax coming in with Mr. Shorten has slowed down housing. It has brought down the value of people's homes. And people are feeling it, they're feeling uneasy. Sydney and Melbourne and Brisbane particularly work on the psyche of my house price is rising 
and I'm feeling comfortable. So do you think but the negative this, gearing this, and, the frank, this, and indeed the franking credits uh, policies of Labour will be very damaging to them? I, I do, I do. And I also think that, you know, if Labour to win, was mm -hmm. to win, I think they're going to have terrible trouble getting that sort of stuff through this funny old Senate, because they're not going to control the Senate. Mm -hmm. And already a lot of people have said, um, we don't, a lot of senators have said, we don't like the franking issue, for example, mm. which means Mr Bowen's budget's not going to add up again. Oh, look, <laughs> Graham Morris, it's a fascinating, going to be a fascinating campaign. Love to get you back uh, a little bit further in, but thank you so much for your insights. Good to get you. Well, let's go to this big takeover talk now. Now, Las Vegas-based casino giant Wynn Resorts has made a $10 billion takeover offer for Crown Resorts. The proposal has an implied value of $14.75 a share, half in cash and half in Wynn Resorts shares. Crown shares soared to a record high as investors hedged their bets on an even higher bid. A sale would mark an end, though, to James Packer's 12-year foray into casinos after he rebounded managed his father's media empire as a gambling concern in 2007. It would also be Australia's biggest M&A deal so far this year and would put Wynn in charge of the $2.2 billion Barangaroo Casino precinct. Well, for more, our chief business reporter Leo Shanahan joins me at the desk and the Australian's business columnist Terry McCran joins us live from Melbourne. Gentlemen, welcome there. Um, Terry, if I can go to you first, down, down in the, uh, the, the city, which is <laughs> of great interest right, at the right moment. next door. Exactly. Right next door to the so uh, this comes as a bit of a surprise. I mean, gosh, the share price has jumped 20%, hasn't it? Well, it, yes and no, Tiki. I, I'll come to the no in a minute. Um, but the yes is, I guess we all thought that, uh, like all these entrepreneurs, when they build a, a great global business, as uh, James has done with Crown, they're there for life. We've seen mm. that with Murdoch, we've seen that with Lowy, we've seen that with all sorts of people. They, you, it, the idea that they would sell out uh, is inconceivable. But I think the no part is we've also also seen James go through some pretty torrid personal issues, mm. and you know he's a very mercurial person. One day he's up, one day he's down, and he's he's basically left the casino business uh, in the last half half dozen or so months. He's got off the board of Crown mm. to deal with his issues. Uh, so that the, the, the reality of his personal life and, and the demons that he's now, now battling makes it more probable that, that we ended up with the situation today. Now, I look, with the way I look at it, you put all that together and there will be a deal. It may not be this deal mm. and it may not be this buyer, but there will now be a deal because in effect, the fact that it's gone public like this tells us in, a, in fairly unsubtle terms that James Packer has put a for sale sign on the company or at least he's prepared to entertain offers. It's like somebody comes knocking on your door and yeah. says, can I buy your house? Um, James Packer said, mm, yeah, OK, he just hasn't thrown them out. All right, all right. Well, Leo, um, OK, what are the sort of issues? Is that a done deal if someone comes in with a 20% uh, premium? Yeah, I think it, I agree with Terry that the, it looks very likely that a deal will be done. Mm. Whether or not it's this deal is, is very hard to say because I think there are a lot of trouble. There is a lot of trouble with wind just coming in. Uh, you can't just roll into Australia and buy a casino. There's large regulatory issues involved. Uh, a sale of this size would need, obviously, further approval as well, whether you'd get yeah. that. They have an A, triple C and, co and competition element to, to that test. And Mr Wynn himself, um, he, he fell foul of the Me Too movement, didn't he? Yeah, well, he's a goner from his own business, right. even though the, the Wynn involvement in this is fascinating, of course. So right. Steve, and, uh, Steve Wynn and Kerry Packer go back to the Las Vegas days when mm. Kerry would be betting there. Apparently, uh, he gave James a bit of a leg up into Macau, of course, and that's all done and dusted now. And they had a bit of a falling out when James tried to get back in to Las Vegas. But uh, Steve Wynn is, is notionally gone from the company. One would think there's got to be some element of uh, a man with that le level of power in a company like that. I mean, he's, he, on the weekend, he met Donald Trump down at Las Vegas airport. So yeah. he's by no means But when it comes individual. to being a fit and proper person, uh, I mean, clearly it's more than a box ticking exercise. Well, yeah, well, look, it? he's not a CEO. He's not the CEO anymore. And, but there'd still be a lot of hoops to jump through for yeah. these guys. But it is a fascinating bit uh, yeah. for all those reasons that um, 
and, and Terry pointed and out. And Terry, of course, we've got Crown down in Melbourne, but there is this huge project at Barangaroo in Sydney as well, isn't there? And uh, presumably it's a matter of a state-by-state -state approval, you'd think. Well, indeed. And, and just a, a, a side issue, of course, there is that James is going to take a big penthouse at the top of that crown <laughs> exercise. Will, yeah. that's, will that still go ahead? I mm -hmm. don't know, mm -hmm. because he's essentially living in L.A. now with trips down to his uh, Polo Ranch in, in Argentina. But to, to come back to what Leah was saying, I think all the other regulatory issues will be not quite a box ticky exercise, the competition, the ACCC, FERB and so on. I think he's put his finger on the, the big issue which causes difficulty, which is the fit and proper person, the whole casino ownership dynamic, where you've got to really explore behind uh, not only the, the, the upfront directors and, and, and managers of the company, but the major shareholders. And although Steve Wynn is no longer a major shareholder, he sold out, uh, his wife is still uh, a big shareholder. And, and mm. in fact, she might be the, the biggest at the mm. moment, and or his ex-wife, and if this proceeds, James would end up becoming, I think, the biggest single sh individual shareholder, and then the wife would be number two. But um, when I say, you know, setting aside that regular issue, because any time anybody puts their hand up, the point I was making is, is, is really that it, uh, this, won't get, this won't seal the deal. I think uh, James will want, will want something more than the price that's been offered, because this is basically the price that Crown was trading at a few months ago. And, and I think, again, that, that bigger point is that now that it seems that it's for sale, Mm. You may well get any number of other players who, who would also put their hand up. And I think, again, uh, all the shareholders of Crown, but particularly James, would like there to be an auction. I mean, we all yeah. know the way auctions go, you get two bidders, you get, a lot, you got a, you get a, a, a lot higher price than when you only have one bidder. And, and of course it would be, Terry, the end of an era. I mean, he made such a huge call to move out of media uh, into casinos. Um, I think it was, was it Ashok Jacob, Jacob who helped him then? Well, who will be helping him now? Well, Matt Grounds uh, at uh, UBS and Calvin Berry, the, the Melbourne UBS guy, they're the two key advisors in this process mm. um, and and obviously you'll need a whole lot of legal advice but when you say the end of an era uh, Tiki, it's it's the end of, a, of an epoch I mean uh, <laughs> the idea that you know that you wouldn't have a packer as a major player in the Australian corporate scene mm. we've had one since almost a hundred years there've been a, there's been a cat a packer obviously originally in the media business but as you say in the last uh, 15 or so years specifically in the in the gaming business mm. what do they say three generations but you know he'll still end up with all the money yeah, though, look, you know. to return to a former point i mean you think las vegas is tough try dealing with sydney politics and development i mean that <laughs> that, that is what's going to be really tough in all of this because it is really for all intents and purposes the purchase of brand guru and that is their major asset now right and how mm. they develop that mm. and dealing with uh you know not just new south wales government but local players yes uh, gee, that's going to be a tough ask. And well, walking away from walking away from a business that he's well, look, you wouldn't call it a failure, but yeah. you wouldn't call it a success in the way that they wanted to do it. Uh, Macau obviously sold out. Las Vegas didn't work out. Other projects like Sri Lanka they had to walk mm. away from. So it's a big call at this point to say, right, you know, I'm done. He'd take okay. two billion cash and ten percent of win. That's not a bad deal for anyone, yeah. but is that good enough for him? And finally, uh, Terry, there's always Perth. Always Perth. <laughs> yeah, they've, they've got Perth assets there, haven't they? Got Burwood yeah, as just, well. Just to pick up on Larry's yeah. point, I mean, when Barangaroo started, uh, it, 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 Packer was riding high, and gaming, high roller gaming in Australia was riding high. Yes. Uh, but the world's changed. I mean, China's yeah. not the China it was of five or six mm. years ago, and mm. and and the other guy, Star, have become much more competitive in grabbing some of that high roller market. So, mm. it's it's. I think it is probably a good time. Uh, particularly if your heart is no longer in it, to be to be taking the big check and and doing whatever James wants to do with it. All right. Well, it's in play. Uh, Terry McCann, Leo Shanahan, thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you, Pete. All right, coming up, the fight to get the unions an automatic seat at the board table. AWU Secretary Dan Walton up next. You're watching Tiki on Your Money. Now, back to Tiki. 
Welcome back. Well, this week, union heavyweights gathered on the Gold Coast for the AWU's biennial conference. High on the agenda is for unions to get an automatic seat at every board table. First off, the union is targeting bankrupt businesses. National Secretary Dan Walton will seek approval for a resolution supporting a charter to be signed by banks, administrators and lawyers to give unions a voice in managing company collapses. It's the first step in the union's bid to change Labour policy and then get, uh, and then if a shortened Labour government is elected in May, uh, get on with it. Dan Walton joined me from the sidelines of the event a little earlier. Dan Walton, nice to talk to you at the conference there today. Now, in your speech, you're calling for mandated union representation on private company boards. Why do we need that? Well, one of the biggest issues that we've got in this country is uh, a model of collaboration. Uh, not only that, but we've got a lack of diversity around the board composition right around the country. Uh, we had, through the RM administration, an opportunity to meet with a bunch of companies that were looking to move in to purchase the steelworks. And quite a, few, quite a few of those businesses talked to us about the potential of setting up a board with some of the workers or their representatives taking place to get some greater ownership and collaboration. They saw it as a failing of the RM model. Since that time, I've had the opportunity to have a look around at a lot of businesses, a lot of structures around the world. Um, Australia ranks, I think, uh, alongside Pakistan and Timor-Leste when it comes to collaboration. And that's really a big focus of something we're trying to drive going forward. I noticed the Labor Party doesn't support mandatory uh, union representation on boards. And given the representation unions have in the workforce at large, why do you deserve that sort of representation? Yeah, well, b businesses keep screaming out that they want greater productivity, they want greater innovation. Uh, at the same time, people keep talking about the need for collaboration, but no one's really doing anything about it to make any difference. And one of the big factors affecting us and affecting our members is wage wages growth. Uh, but one of the other things that's affecting a lot of our members going forward is going to be as uh, obviously um, energy uh, intensive industry, trade exposed industries, is that we're going to have to work together closely with business throughout the changes going forward. If you look around the world, all the different models, they've got systems in place where workers have got a greater say and greater involvement um, in the decision-making processes. They are more productive, they are higher wage economies, uh, and they are transforming into the next generation of manufacturers and the like. And I just think, for us, it's really short-sighted um, if we just simply say, well, you know, just consult with us a little bit more, we'll just sit around the table and have some negotiations. We, what we want to do is put in place some formal structures around it, but we're completely realistic that we need to do more work to get there. We need to research, we need to get a better understanding of different models, we need to develop an idea of what it would look like in, in an Australian context. And we've had conversations with different partners around this already, and so far the feedback, I've got to be completely honest, the feedback from CEOs right around the, uh, the country has been overwhelmingly positive. We have not had any negativity uh, raised about uh, some of these initiatives yet. Mm. It's interesting because at the same time you've got a, a push by uh, the likes of the ACTU and others for what is effectively pattern bargaining, industry-wide bargaining. You've also got this pressure for uh, a living wage now. Uh, I mean, uh, there are uh, boards, one would think, who are very worried about the pressure this puts on them, particularly in terms of their uh, duty to their own shareholders. Correct. Yep, yeah, and that's something that has to be looked at. We're not walking like we're not running away from that. We're completely and utterly aware of uh, the transition, a long transition that it would have to take uh, to get to that point. Um, the first step is getting a better understanding of the different models available. Um, to do that, we need some partnerships, and we've started discussions around that. Uh, then we need, once we've done that work, we need to have a look in terms of some Australian partners and who wants to trial this. And this isn't saying all of a sudden we're going to massively change the structure uh, of not just director sort of duties, but more so the structure and makeup um, of boards around the country. Uh, what we're saying is, like diversity, when we were trying to get uh, more women onto boards of the top Australian businesses, ASX listed businesses, that was a process that was announced a long time ago, and there's been a lot of work get, to get towards that point. And for me, I sort of see it as the same way. I mean, I'm not suggesting that we say, let's do this, and then tomorrow, you know, we find a, a board spot right around the country. I'm saying that we've got to work towards it and do it in a smart way. We're not. 
Uh, we're not foolish of the challenges around it. Um, I've had a lot of conversations. The, the biggest feedback that I've had thus far around this is the lack of diversity on Australian boards. The CEOs, particularly CEOs who have got international experience, talk about the cookie cutter approach to directors that sit around the boardroom tables, that have come from the same schools, that know the same clubs and the same networks. This is an opportunity to be able to create some additional diversity in those directors CEOs, chairmen who have had experience on overseas boards, particularly in Europe, speak incredibly highly of where these practices are in place. I was interested to see that when it comes to insolvency, both Leon Dwyer and uh, Mark Menther are supporting uh, a, a Labor government mandating union representation on uh, uh, companies that are in, indeed in bankruptcy situations. Now, how would that work? Yeah, so what we're, what we're looking at, most of the time, banks are the overwhelming secured creditors. They're the ones that pick the administrative firms. They are the ones that ultimately dictate the terms around how the, you know, the insolvency is going to work. Uh, what we have seen is in the examples where, uh, for whatever the arrangements, if you think back for ANSET, if you think in terms of Tassau down in Tassie with Salmon, if you think more recently for Arium, for us, they were examples where workers were involved in the process and overall substantially better outcomes were able to be reached. Tassau is now one of the biggest uh, exporters uh, for uh, the Tassie economy. And you know that business went through extremely tough times. We were able to get in, get the workers together from multiple companies to strap together a bigger business being Tassau and now it's absolutely flourishing. Um, Arium, for example, uh, is an absolute another one where we were involved throughout the journey working alongside the banks. You know, I've told the story before where it was the big four banks and us sitting in the room together trying to work out how we we're going to manage this going forward. And uh, overwhelmingly, our interests were about making sure that we found a solution that protect, not only protected the workers, but protected the communities in those regional areas. And I think that experience has shown that we've been able to deliver amazing results. And so it's based on our experience is not based on just a desire to have more involvement in these processes. Can I ask you a couple on policy? Now, we've had the Prime Minister and Michaelia Cash out today with workers standing behind them, cars uh, behind them, talking about the concerns over Labor's electric cars policy and, in particular, uh, taking the choices away of what cars people might be able to drive uh, through this uh, mandated emission standard. Yeah, well, there's a few, uh, uh, there's a little bit of irony in that. Number one, Michaela Cash is actually back out in front of uh, the camera again, and been in hiding for a long period of time since uh, raiding our offices of being obviously the minister responsible for the department who undertook that. And uh, obviously standing in front of some workers as well, talking about their interests again, I find quite ironic. But I mean, Bill Shorten spoke at our conference dinner last night and he made the, the funny point that you know, the government would have you believe that they're about to, uh, about to come around to everyone's house and take their youths off them um, the day after they win the election. Um, the reality is we look after all the refinery workers in this country and we are very, very keen to find a solution, like in a lot of our, our other industries, that we transform uh, over time as technology improves, new technology like renewable technology, et cetera, comes into place. There's going to be some change in these workplaces and it's about working through that sensibly. Obviously they announced some um, uh, vehicle emission standards. Um, I've had conversations with a lot of the CEOs of the refineries already uh, and we want to work together to make sure that whatever happens if Labor is to get elected, uh, that there is a smart and sensible transition to put in place these new changes. Dan, are you concerned uh, with the recent rise in activism, uh, green activism, which seems to be heading towards our abattoirs and onto farms uh, at the moment? I mean, at what stage is uh, this, this sort of activism, which would appear to uh, interfere in the production process, OK? Well, I've got to say, I, I support people's right to protest. Um, and uh, I support the protests having some, in, in some way, you know, trying to get their uh, political points across. Um, we, you know, in some ways, have, when I read the news about it over the last couple of days, I thought, well, it's good they're not turning up to our sites to try and protest at this point in time. Um, uh, but jokes aside, uh, a lot of these protesters are starting to get into the areas where they're starting to come into harm with our, uh, our members, 
um, be it on farms, uh, for the meat workers unions, uh, be it in the abattoirs. Uh, for me, that's the sort of concerning point where their activities potentially jeopardise the safety and welfare of our members, then that's obviously going to be a concern for us and I'm sure a lot of other unions. But uh, we support their right to protest. Again, it's, it's really how you do it in a smart and, smart and sensible way to be able to get your message across and trying to, obviously, you, you know, they would be looking to garner more support and have more backers. And I think, um, you know, if some of those activities substantially harm others um, who are innocent bystanders in this, then uh, I think that's only going to do damage to their brand and reputation. Finally, Melissa Price, the Environment Minister, has approved the Adani uh, water plan. Uh, presumably there are a lot of potential Adani employees up north who'd be pretty pleased about that. Uh, do you support it? Uh, as I've said before, you know, for Adani it's always one of these propositions that if it stacks up environmentally and stacks up financially, um, then it should be going ahead. Uh, Adani has just managed to get itself into this weird position that it's such a topical mind site. I mean, I think um, you know, jobs and the creation of jobs is a good thing. Uh, for us, I've said before, a lot of our industries are heavily reliant upon coal, um, obviously more so for generation. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I struggle to see uh, any role like the issues we've spoken about before. If you think in terms of Narrabri with the Santos project, um, obviously coming over the top to be able to uh, knock on the head one of these projects, I don't think is a, a particularly good approach. Um, I think that if you've got the independent bodies in place that are making the determinations on these projects, uh, they're the responsible agencies to do so. Good on you, Dan. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tiki. Yeah, Dan Walton there. Coming up, electric evolution. Bill Shorten shores up support for his electric car campaign. We hear from the industry set to benefit. Tim Washington, the CEO of Australia's biggest electric car charging company. Up next. This is Tiki on Your Money, covering the big business stories. Yes, welcome back. Well, since opposition leader Bill Shorten announced that Labor would set a target for 50% of new cars to be electric vehicles, there's been an outcry about the feasibility of the target by 2030. Just today, Liberal frontbencher Michaelia Cash said Labor were, quote, coming after tradies' utes. And, hyperbole aside, there's a very little skin on the bones of this policy. Well, Tim Washington is the CEO of Australia's largest electric vehicle charging company, which is also building our first national charging network, ChargeFox. The company recently received six million from the federal government. Leo Shanahan spoke to Mr Washington about the viability of Labor's plan, cost, and how long it will take to charge your electric car. Now, look, I uh, wanted to start off by asking you your reaction to uh, the debate and uh, some of the outcry that's been uh, taking place since sure. Labor's announcement of this 50% uh, electric car uh, target for 2030. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I don't want to comment on the politics. Yeah. Um, I come at this from a business perspective. Um, it's really great to see both parties engaged um, in the debate around electric vehicles and I think it brings us in line with what other countries are talking about. So that's really encouraging for me. Okay, so do you think that a 50% target by 2030 is doable and is it possible without large scale subsidies or taking uh, certain types of petrol cars off the road? Yeah, so I think the thing to remember about um, the target, and again, you know, I'm not saying um, I'm not participating in the politics, yeah, but sure. the thing about the target is that it's consistent with what has been announced in the rest of the world. And so you've seen countries with more ambitious targets than us. So, for example, in Norway, they've, um, they want to go 100 percent electric by 2025 and many of the markets have um, basically very stringent targets that they want to hit. My personal opinion is that we will be able to hit that target and there's a key reason why. It's because most manufacturers around the world, because they serve the three largest markets in the EU, China and America, have to hit 
strong government regulation and targets. So they will only be produ producing electric vehicles um, from a certain date onwards. So mm. they're all really focused on that. And so that's why I'm confident we'll hit the target because the manufacturers will be producing these vehicles. Yeah, okay. In an interview late last year, you said we'll see EVs hit 10% of the new vehicle sales in the next five years, leading to around 120 new, 120,000 new vehicles per year. We'd have to almost quadruple that rate though. Uh, to hit that 20, 30, 50% target though. Yeah, and I think you'll see that the pace of innovation is unrelenting. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't know if you're aware of this, um, but, you know, if you look at the growth of smartphones, if you look at the growth of users in the internet or Candy Crush, for example, nobody could really have predicted how quickly we got to those numbers. And given that electric cars are ultimately going to be cheaper and better for the environment than their petrol and diesel counterparts, I wouldn't be surprised at the acceleration of that uptake. Okay, what about price point? Because this, this seems like uh, a real problem at the moment. I'm just, just, just one example, the Hyundai Kona, obviously a much more accessible type of car uh, to the Australian middle class. Now, a petrol Kona runs, uh, goes through as little as 26,000, up to 40,000. The electric Kona starts at $63,000. The Ionic, slightly cheaper, what, Hyundai, 50,000. That's a real problem. How do, you, how do you start getting over that? Yeah, so there's absolutely no doubt that with all innovation, um, it starts out more expensive. I don't know if you remember when the first plasma and LCD televisions came out, when the first phones came out, they were completely out of reach. Mm. Um, but as with everything, they come down in price over time. So we expect to see price parity in the dealership as early as 2024. Mm. So that means that when you walk into a dealership in 2024, you'll pay the same for an electric car as you would a petrol or diesel vehicle. Um, but it's just much cheaper to charge and it costs less to maintain. Will people so be, that's how we're going to get over it. Yeah, okay. Will people be paying more for cars generally, do you think? There will be a price point somewhere in the middle there? Or do you think that they can be brought down to levels that people are paying for, you know, petrol sedans and four-wheel drives, et cetera, at the moment? What's interesting about electric vehicles is that ultimately when... Um, when we hit mass production and battery prices come down to the level that we know they're going to hit, electric cars will actually be cheaper than petrol and diesel vehicles because they have less moving parts and they're cheaper to produce. And so really we're just waiting for scale and we're waiting for mm. the battery price to hit an equilibrium and then we actually think electric cars will be cheaper than petrol and diesel vehicles. Um, ironically enough, in the future, the only people who will be able to afford to drive petrol or diesel vehicles and to fuel those vehicles will be those who um, are much better off in society. Okay, so uh, the federal government, the Prime Minister and others have called uh, this proposal a weekend killer because, and, and Labor is saying, and the uh, coalition is saying they're coming after your ute, saying Labor is coming after your ute. Uh, hyper hyperbole aside, don't you think the point here though is that there, there are types of vehicles that aren't electric at the moment, that are popular among Australians, do you think there's going to be enough options? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So it's true that at the moment we don't see any mass market utes, um, and, but in the future we will. So if you look at a company like Rivian, for example, in the US, they've proposed an electric ute. And I think it only makes sense um, for car manufacturers to produce vehicles that they know are popular. So for example, you know, some of the um, electric cars coming out, in fact, most of them are SUVs because SUVs are a large market for cars in general. So in Australia, we'll start seeing utes that are produced that are also electric. And the great thing about utes um, and work vans is that because they're electric vehicles, um, tradies can actually go on site and they can plug in their tools into their vehicles and charge their tools um, using their cars. They're all really great possibilities with electric cars that we don't necessarily have at the moment in large numbers. Okay, now you're, I want to talk about your network because it's going to be Australia's lightest charging network. Uh, only Tesla's bigger at the moment, if I'm right. Now you got six million dollars worth of federal funding late last year. Uh, tell us about how that's going and uh, would you be expecting more funding under, say, a Labor government? Um, so I think you're talking about the ChargeFox network. Yeah. Um, so 
It's not my network. It's the Chargebox network. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it is the first ultra rapid charging network in Australia, linking the major capital cities, um, which will allow you to charge your car up in as little as 15 minutes. Um, and it's going well. We're about to open our second site. In fact, we have opened our second site and we'll finish 22 sites by the end of 2019. Um, I can't comment on funding. Again, I'm not a political player, mm. so I'm not sure. All I can say is that we welcome support from both sides of government when it comes to EV charging infrastructure. Where do you see that infrastructure landing uh, long term between, say, private and, 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 and public expenditure and infrastructure? Obviously, there are big companies like Tesla who have their own network, but it, is there a standardization there that can work as well? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there are two points to keep in mind here. The first is that the industry has arrived at plug standards. So what that means is that when you go and buy a Tesla or you go buy a Hyundai um, or any other vehicle, they all have the same plugs, right? So we have set types of plugs in the Australian market um, across all the manufacturers. And that's something that the industry came together to agree. The second is that um, there is a a, a, a kind of um, a sharing of costs between public and private when it comes to EV charging infrastructure. So what I mean by that is that a lot of charging is done at home and the rest is done in public, which means that there are lots and lots of parties who bear the responsibility and the cost for installing charging infrastructure, ranging right from the person who buys an electric car for their own home and install a charging station at home, all the way to companies like Chargefox who are installing these really big ultra rapid charging networks. Now, on, on sure. charging times, uh, there has been debate around uh, how long this should take. Uh, Bill Shorten mentioned eight to ten minutes. Others are saying hours. Uh, in your opinion, for a, a, a latest model, say one of these Hyundais I mentioned, how long will it take uh, to charge one of those at home and uh, on the highway? So this is one of those rare occasions where everybody is right. <laughs> so depending on your power delivery um, source and the power levels, um, it can take hours at home, for example, or it can take under half an hour if, it's, if it is in public. And so, yeah, everybody's right when it comes to charging times. It just depends on what charger you're using. And what, what will the charging time be in your new network on average? So the charging times on our, so our charging stations are capable of delivering a full charge in just 15 minutes. Mm. And as vehicle battery technology increases, we'll be able to lessen that time even further. The technology for the infrastructure side is already there. That's the stuff that we're putting in right now. All right, Tim Washington, fascinating subject. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much, cheers. Coming up, the budget's big spend on infrastructure. Here's the $3 billion congestion busting fund boosting all it's, it's cracked up to be. We hear from the sector's independent think tank next. Now, back to Tiki. Welcome back. Well, the centrepiece of last week's budget was the government's infrastructure package, including a $3 billion funding boost to its congestion-busting fund. Labor argues that there's a little show for the near term. However, the sector's independent think tank, Infrastructure Partnerships Australia CEO Adrian Dwyer, came in to give me his take on the cash splash. Adrian, thanks for coming in. Now the budget. How did you see it from an infrastructure point of view? There were lots of announcements. Yeah, so it was a solid infrastructure budget. I think we all get distracted by the headline figures sometimes. There was $100 billion over 10 years. Voodoo uh, we, financing? Well, s some of it, but no new vehicles with the voodoo financing that we've seen emerge over previous years. And what we welcomed this yeah. year was actually a real increase in funding over the forward estimate. So, what do you mean by voodoo financing, by the way? So over the last few years, we've seen this emerging trend from the Commonwealth Government about wanting to be a financial investor in projects. Um, and in, in some cases that makes sense. So things like Western Sydney Airport, where mm -hmm. the, the market meant that at that time that was the only way for, for them to plausibly invest, but also in some other areas that have been muted. Um, for instance, Melbourne Airport Rail Link at one stage, mm -hmm. which is a, a project that require a big operating subsidy every year, not something I'd want a financial investment in. Right. But we've seen less of that in this budget and more real money. So around $30 billion over the forward estimates, which is $8 billion more than last year's budget. Even so, I think Anthony Albanese, the shadow infrastructure minister, came out saying, really, there's a lot of the promises are back 
weighted, you know, way beyond uh, the uh, first four years. You know. Well, that's right. So what we've seen is governments tend to push out the spending to the after the forward estimates, mm. so not the four years in the budget, but the the six remaining years of their investment program. That has challenges because it's very opaque. It's difficult to see actually where that money is being spent, where it's being deployed, and in particular, some of it's three federal elections away. So. Well, who knows who'll be in charge? Exactly. So changing priorities. Now, welcome a longer term view, but actually the four forward years are the most important. And this budget did have more money for infrastructure than the last budget. I guess the other issue for you is that, uh, I mean, this is this government's budget. It may not be this government that's in power in May. Yeah, I think it's clearly this is an election budget. It was framed in the context of an election that will happen in May. I think a, a returned government or a new government will probably want to make changes, certainly uh, a new government, if Labour is successful at the election, uh, Chris Bowen said there'll be a mini budget later mm. in the year. So we would anticipate some changes to the, to the infrastructure funding. But I'm I'm buoyed by the fact that Labour's been um, quite strong on its infrastructure agenda. Anthony mm. Albanese has been in the portfolio as shadow and minister for 10 years. So if there is a change of government, I think we will see a strong focus on infrastructure. Yes, That probably means reallocation of where some of that money is well, spent. Well, I was going to say, how many high-speed high rails do we want? I mean, all these high-speed rails going from, you know, cities to inland, all around the country. I mean, is it really going to happen? Well, the first thing I'd say is that they're faster rail, not fast rail. Right. Uh, there's an interesting quirk in the language. So these are not high-speed bullet trains that you might see in Japan or Europe. They're talking about 200 kilometre an hour um, intercity type. Train. So they're the, going to happen? They'll all be connected up? I think it has to happen over time because one of the ways that we can take the pressure off big cities like Sydney and Melbourne is to be able to use those satellite cities, mm. so places like Geelong, like Newcastle, like Wollongong, mm. being able to open up those towns, those cities with faster rail links has got to be good for those cities and, of course, the, the major cities they serve as well. And, Edwin, speaking of voodoo financing, uh, looking at the government's commitment to eliminate debt by 2030, uh, I was speaking to Matthias Corman on Budget Night and saying, well, does that include a write-down of the NBN or not? And he didn't really want to engage on that front. But surely we've now got the NBN, we've got Inland Rail, we've got Snowy. All these are off-budget. Um, I mean, how... Do we know that they're going to be uh, able to deliver a return? Well, I think the reality is if something is going to be off the books, then it should be able to support itself from the charges levied on users rather than on taxpayers. Well, NBN demonstrably can't. If can't that do can't it. be done, then there has to be a conversation about what's the appropriate financing structure for that. Mm. Um, it's a, it's a, a sort of a longer term problem, one that you can kick the can down the road on a number of times. But at some stage, you've got to look at, is this thing commercially viable? And how do you make it commercially viable? Is it a write down? Uh, is but you'd it... agree that the NBN is likely going to have to be written down? I think it's a, a broadly accepted fact that the NBN doesn't um, have the commercial underpinnings to survive as a standalone Mm. entity without some sort of restructure. And what about those two other projects, Snowy and Inland Rail? I mean, Inland Rail is a challenge. Snowy's a bit harder because of where the, the cost implications lie. So Snowy Hydro said they've been able, they'll be able to um, retain earnings and um, use equity to be able to... to well, again, that. it's more of your voodoo financing in a way, isn't well, it? <laughs> you, you've got a bit of... At least there is a user pays model yes. in there. Um, of course, there is the cost of connecting from a transmission line perspective. So that mm. cost burden is borne by a, a broader base of users in a, a regulated market. So there's an interesting question about where that cost burden lies. Uh, inland rail is another big challenge. That's a very expensive mm. uh, project, uh, strategically important, but the economic case is very thin. Um, the commercial case relies on the Hunter Valley coal chain. Um, so there does need to be a, a, an assessment of that and MBN to see where they can be sustained. What that do you way. think of calls from people like uh, Jennifer Westacott recently to look at some of these big infrastructure projects where there may be a lot of public interest mm. in a different way from a pure cost benefit? A bit like you've got ESG now uh, floating into how directors should think about growth mm. in companies. Uh, so I, I think Jennifer's right in the sense that benefit cost ratios are one tool to assess projects and they should be considered alongside lots of other tools like the strategic need, the deliverability, the risk profile of a project. Uh, benefit cost ratios can include a whole range of different scenarios, put into them and a whole range of different benefits and different costs. The important thing is then it's not doesn't produce a number that gives you an answer. It produces a tool for a decision maker to weigh up against all the other evidence. But it, it in and of itself has to be a rigorous 
process is what you're saying. It, to some degree, it, it's an art, not a science. It needs mm. to be rigorous. It needs to be transparent. That's why you have bodies like Infrastructure Australia and others that can yes. put the, the rule of thumb over that. Um, the important thing, though, is that it's taken by decision makers. It's one input alongside all the other inputs they have to consider about whether you prioritise a hospital in Perth versus a rail line in Melbourne. Yeah. That's a really difficult consideration and we should have all the tools available. A lot of talk around electric cars at the moment. It seems to be the thing to talk about during the election campaign. Uh, you're very concerned about the cost. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm concerned about a number of areas around electric vehicles. And I think I welcome the Labour Party having um, put a policy forward. I welcome the coalition having spoken about electric vehicles for a number of years. Mm. Uh, but there are a, a whole host of additional policy questions that flow from electric vehicles and having a target is one part but then there's also how do you deal with the grid when people turn home, get home at six o'clock and plug in their electric car how do you deal with uh, how do you pay for roads when we're no longer collecting fuel excise because mm. electric vehicles don't uh, I mean are you worried excise? that we don't actually have a model now that's already beginning to work to transition from um, you know petrol cars to electric cars in terms of our road tolls and our road costs yeah I think that's something we've got to focus on and at the next term of parliament's got to deal with that road funding issue because we've got a few years before it becomes too hard to do yeah. but the next term of parliament has got to deal with how do you pay for roads when you don't collect fuel excise how do you deal with things like the investment strike in energy networks when you're going to have a huge amount of additional demand put on the grid potentially from electric vehicles mm. but we're not investing in those networks because um, people are unaware of the, the regulatory stability. So there's a whole host of policy questions that come after saying we want more electric vehicles. Indeed. And finally, I should say, a bit of a cue for you guys. You've got Sir Rod Eddington coming on board as your chair. Yeah, absolutely. Very proud of it. And Sir Rod starts in May. Yes. Yeah, so, and how do you think that's going to change things for you? I think it's so Sir Rod's got a, a, obviously a great international and domestic profile. He's very focused on um, the national questions from an infrastructure perspective. And he also comes with that background of having started Infrastructure Australia. So a highly credible face and voice for the organisation. Adrian Dwyer, I wish you all the best with it. Sounds good. Thank you. And that's all for the show tonight. Thanks for your company.